Welcome back to Philosophy for Flourishing, the show where we explore principles and practices for living the happiest, most fulfilling life possible. Now, back on the first episode of this show, Craig and I discussed our goals for the show, and I put it in terms of this analogy of building an operating system for a flourishing life. <clears throat> and I like that analogy because you know, we come to this, we're like complex machines and we come into this world without an operating system and we have to build one little by little over time. Some of us do this. We absorb ideas from our parents, from our culture, from school, from society at large. And we also, many of us take a more uh, conscious and deliberate approach to thinking about what ideas help us and hinder us in our lives and and what ideas uh, enable us to go on to flourish. So since then, since Craig and I uh, talked about this and, and the operating system, building an operating system for your life, an operating system for flourishing, we've discussed a couple dozen topics related to flourishing, and we've really pulled out different principles and practices for, for flourishing. And I recently began rereading Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and it struck me. So I had read it before, but now I'm reading it again. I'm reading it with a group of, of really active-minded readers led by Robert Begley and Carrie Ann Biondi, who is actually an Aristotle scholar. And uh, coming back to it with my new context, it allowed me to see it through a whole different lens. And I immediately began to realize that this book and the ideas in this book can give us a tremendous leg up in our project on this show of building an operating system for a flourishing life. So I wanna dedicate a number of episodes, probably not sequentially, they're gonna be scattered throughout, interspersed with other things, but I wanna dedicate a number of episodes to pulling out the gems from this book and giving them to you guys in digestible form. So today, Robert and Carrie Ann are joining me to simply answer the question, why study Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics? So thank you both so much for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thank it's you, a John. to be here. Yes. <laughs> so right out of the gate in book one, I was, really, <clears throat> I was really struck by Aristotle's quest that he sets out on because as I was indicating, it bears so much similarity to what we're trying to do on this show. Aristotle aims to home in on this, the nature of the highest good. And he says that, uh, if we know what this highest good is, then like archers will have a target to aim at. And further, he pretty much says that everyone agrees that the highest good, what, what the highest good is. And he calls it in the original Greek, eudaimonia. And Carrie Ann, since you, you know Greek and you've translated many of Aristotle's works, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, this concept eudaimonia uh, what it means to us for, for our modern context, you know, how it's typically translated. What, what is this, what is this eudaimonia? Well, eudaimonia is often translated as happiness. And that's a bit imprecise because to the modern ear, when we hear the word happy, people think, oh, we, I feel great today. <laughs> However, that's not uh, the only aspect of what Aristotle means. Uh, eudaimonia is from two Greek words, eu and daimon, literally translated as wellness of spirit. And the, the closest approximation in English that captures what wellness of spirit in the different levels at which Aristotle analyzes eudaimonia is flourishing. There are certain objective conditions, biological, psychological, emotional, intellectual, that need to be tended to properly in all living beings. And wellness of spirit for the human being must take all of these factors into account. There are facts about us as an as a embodied biological species, certain requirements uh, for life satisfaction and achievement uh, that are psychological, intellectual growth, et cetera. So I think flourishing probably captures it more accurately than other English words. Uh, to, to get at the layers of wellness of spirit. So how appropriate is that? So Aristotle is in this work, the Nicomachean Ethics, 
he's examining the basis for, for flourishing, for human flourishing, for understanding what enables us to flourish. He's not looking at, okay, happiness, this sort of fleeting state that comes and goes or like, oh, I'm eating cotton candy. I'm happy. Oh, now I'm done and I'm not. No, he's looking at, okay, what sort of uh, re requirements in our lives enable us to, to flourish. And, you know, this is pretty remarkable in and of itself that he has such a similar goal to the one that we're after in this show of building an operating system for a flourishing life. So if you take, for instance, Plato, if you compare Aristotle to the goals of other ethicists or his goal in his work to those of other ethicists, so his mentor Plato, so whereas Aristotle was clearly aiming at figuring out how to live the good life, Plato was more interested in defining the good in and of itself without relation to life. And in my understanding, Plato actually thinks that in effect, the good can exist only as an imperfect reflection of an immaterial form or a template in another realm. So if we look to Plato, although he is a, an extremely powerful thinker, uh, we're not going to find a mind engaged in the same sort of quest that we're on, that we're interested in, in this show, or, you know, uh, if we relate this to a more contemporary thinker, Jordan Peterson, Peterson's project is in some respects, at least a little closer to Aristotle's in that he is looking at uh, things related to life. You know, uh, the, the title of his mega hit 12 rules for life has life right there in the title. He's, he's interested in life to some extent, and it's essentially a self-help book, but you know, is Peterson interested in teaching people about flourishing I think that's kind of a stretch to say that he is. Uh, in my reading, he's interested in teaching people how to make life suck a bit less because life is just this terrible thing and flourishing, it happens, but it's like this happy accident. It's just so rare. And it's not really something that we should aim at or aim for. And you could, you could argue, you can make the argument that Peterson is, 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 uh, attempting to help people make their lives suck less so that they have more chances at flourishing. There's that. But in my reading, I think Pe Peterson's pretty pessimistic about the possibility of a flourishing life. And that's pretty consistent for the most part with most religious thinkers. So Aristotle really stands out in this respect that, that he's clearly aiming at the same goal that we have on this show and there's, you know, there's just so much distinctive about this, about him on this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Carrie, do you want to relate Aristotle's views to those of other ethicists? Uh, well, before that, I think there are a couple of other interesting con contrasts with Peterson. Mm -hmm. For Peterson, uh, with respect to the aim, so he takes suffering as the norm, as the human condition. And that, that's, a, that's a moral primary that must be accounted for. And so minimizing suffering, you're right, make life suck less. But on an, in another respect, he doesn't think life is about seeking flourishing. Uh, he thinks in seeking to take suffering as the norm and to minimize suffering, it's about seeking meaning, which he bifurcates from flourishing. So I think that's an, that's an important difference. And if people feel like meaning in their life is lacking and they're facing obstacles, there's a kind of stoic resignation to that fact that people may gravitate toward and think that, well, you can still make meaning out of suffering. And the Aristotle's orientation toward flourishing and optimizing the conditions of living for, for seeking flourishing and uh, the happiness, the joy that comes from fulfilling those conditions in yourself and in your surrounding institutions and laws and communities. Uh, and there's a meaning to be found there that's very different from Peterson's. So, uh, so I'm glad you brought up that important contrast. Yeah, uh, and thanks for bringing up the meaning point. That's true, yes. Uh, with respect to contemporary ethics, while virtue ethics has made a bit of a comeback in academic circles in the past few decades. In the broader culture, most people, when they think something's a moral issue, I don't think most people every day think, wow, you know, how many uh, moral issues will I face today? They don't often think that they're making hundreds or thousands of choices as moral implications for themselves uh, every single day. 
when they think about it, they often think of, well, there's something I'd like to do and something that I'm told I should be doing. And those two things come into conflict. So on one shoulder, there's the, what should I be doing? Like, <clears throat> what are my duties on the one hand? And on the other hand, they're doing this cost benefit analysis of, well, what can I, what can I get away with? And I think a really amazing uh, show that we watched uh, over the past couple of years, and maybe Robert could say more about this, The, the Good Place, mm, which have yes. seen this. Yeah. So, so a popular representation of academic ethics of the trolley problem, which most people think of as a dilemma. So Chidi represents the duty and the agonizing over what should I do? Oh my goodness. And then we have Eleanor on the other hand, who's a complete, she just wants to maximize her personal uh, desire satisfaction and what can she get out of it? So I think that uh, gratification. the gratification mm -hmm. of what she wants immediately. And there's this clash, I think, in the popular way of thinking about ethics between those two approaches and the good place really popularized in, in a very humorous, and meaningful way. Um, how those are the two main contrasts and Aristotle's is completely different from either one of those. I love that show. I'm glad you brought it up. Go ahead, Robert. Well, I'll say one of my favorite lines from that show when, when she asks Chidi, who died and left Aristotle in charge of ethics? <laughs> Plato, he says. <laughs> Plato died and left Aristotle in charge of ethics. So I wanted to just backtrack just a little bit, John, talk about this book and the title of your program. Okay, so you're pointing out uh, Joe Sachs's translation of Nicomachean yes. Ethics. Which For those who are just listening to this, some are watching on YouTube, others will just listen on, on their favorite podcast app. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you. So for the non-viewing audience, yes, that's Joe Sachs, which is the one that we're going through in our uh, analysis of Aristotle's Ethics. But if we look at the title of your program and your goal here, Philosophy for Flourishing, and this book is, is designed exactly for that purpose, to show philosophy for flourishing. And if also we go back to your idea of the operating system, and the computer technology analog analogy, we're both here, well, the two of us and you, in the comfort of our home, speaking via Zoom, using beautiful technology that, that allows us to do something like this. And that's an aspect, that's, that's an example of, of having a flourishing life, having that opportunity, which Aristotle could not have conceived 2,500 years ago when he created this philosophy. So just wanted to go back to some points that you brought up earlier. Yeah, so Aristotle stands out in that he's clearly aiming at the same goal that we have in this show. And I think we'll also see as we go through the Nicomachean Ethics that he has a lot of similarities in method as well, and that we agree on, on many points of method and can relate those to modern scientific method. So this actually leads us to another part of our discussion today, another really attractive quality of Aristotle as a thinker that I think we should discuss, his comprehensiveness. Uh, Aristotle was an incredibly systematic and comprehensive thinker. Um, could either of you tell us just Aristotle's other areas of expertise and why they, those are relevant to his ethical views? Well, I'll start by saying he, he began as a biologist and looking at nature was the the and life all kinds of life Karen and I went to the place where he was born uh, Stagira and we saw the the landscape the, the sea the fauna and he learned how to categorize uh, all these different types of things coming from his biological interest uh, which all uh, later on certainly paid off in his philosophy but you can talk about other things yeah I'm mentioning categorization of Aristotle created categorical logic. So he created a system of logic to do deductive logic, but he also did uh, work in philosophy of science and epistemology and has a theory of induction that he developed about how you go from a perceiving and reflecting on particulars in the world and, and noticing patterns. And then when you have patterns, like what can you deduce from those, gen, you know, those universal generalizations about the natures of things. And so his ethics actually is grounded in his approach to understanding in a deep way, the biological 
requirements of different species of being. So he goes from logic to biology, to epistemology, to ethics, and the implications of that for fields like politics, poetics, like the arts, uh, rhetoric and law and politics. So he, it, it really does hang together and it's grounded in his uh, view of the nature of things in the world and how we come to know them and building up a naturalistic ethics from those grounds. So I know he's like, uh, you know, he's certainly a paradigm example of the universal genius. And you mentioned some of the other fields that he did work in. Um, where would you say, where else does he have great expertise? Oh, primarily in biology, because he did spend decades uh, studying uh, life. Uh, all animals, forms of yeah, life. All forms of mm -hmm. life, uh, uh, plants, animals, and and he wrote many works that study parts of animal and, and very detailed biological analyses. That's a deep area of specialization, uh, early biology or zoology. Uh, his botany. Yeah, botany. Mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of work on study of and comparative analysis of animals. So Linnaeus created his Linnaean classification system um, in some sense inspired by Aristotle's classification system of, of living organisms. Uh, also, logic is a specialization, and we still teach in logic classes today, categorical logic uh, and uh, predication of qualities of, of, of beings. Uh, and then also, he and his students had gathered all extant examples of constitutions in the world that the, as they knew it to do a comparative analysis of political systems and ways of organizing societies. So I'd say that he's he's kind of like a comparative political scientist as well. So we have the, the father of logic as we know it. We're still using his logic 2,500 years later. Uh, we have a first rate for his time, a first rate biologist who also studied the constitutions of states and, and understood politics. And we have this person bring all this knowledge to bear on ethics. And I think it's just a truism that the person who's best informed about the broadest range of topics, and especially these topics, is in the best position to integrate that knowledge into universal principles. And so it's just, it's often the case that we are convinced of an idea or something strikes us as plausible because it gets something right. For instance, I like the example, honesty is the best policy. Well, it's, it's true that lying leads to all sorts of problems in our lives. It leads to paranoia and feelings of guilt for the person who lies. It also leads to the, the breakdown of social cooperation and a lack of trust, sometimes retribution, and that can be deadly. So honesty is a really great policy, but is honesty the best policy when, for instance, like Nazis come knocking on your door or some like drunken, enraged madman barges in your house and demands to know where your wife and kids are sleeping. It's, it's not. So, you know, the, the principle, it gets something right, but it doesn't integrate all the available data. And so it also gets many things wrong. It's sort of this half truth that we want to avoid making when we're looking for universal philosophic principles. And it's much easier to formulate those, those types of principles when you just have this wealth of facts and data at, at hand, as Aristotle definitely did. So, I mean, from what I understand, too, when he was rediscovered by the Western world, uh, he was simply referred to by academics as the philosopher, you know, one of the, uh, if not the quintessential universal genius. So I think that those are the primary reasons, at least in my mind, why we want to look at Aristotle's ethics on this show. Um, he has the same goal and he brings to uh, he brings to bear on that goal this incredible systematic knowledge of many different and related fields. Uh, did you guys want to add anything before we close out for today? Yeah, one, one other point on Aristotle's background. So his father was a doctor, which is initially gave him this love for like biology and all things living. And his father's name was Nicomachus. And the son's name was Nicomachus. And so that's the reference there to the title of the book. Nicomachean ethics. Yeah, that it's it's addressed to uh, 
It's addressed to the young who are seeking to figure out principles for living. And well, really to anybody, because very subtle, people can be young or old in uh, experience and wisdom and not just age. So uh, it's, it really is intended to be addressed to any individual who's seeking to learn how to live well. And I, I did want to add just one or two other quick points. One, Aristotle raises puzzles and perplexities that beset every individual. And uh, so an important thing is you dig out the gems uh, over a period of time to, to, to polish off and, and to wrestle with uh, on this program. Uh, just mention and highlight a couple of them, that there are experiences people have that are universal that Aristotle addresses, and he goes through in a principled way to figure out what have the best minds of his time gone through to try to figure out how, what's the best explanation for this behavior? What's the best way of thinking about how to wrestle with this going forward and apply it in the context of each person's life? One example is, oh, I knew I should have had that fifth piece of chocolate cake yesterday. Why did I do it? Why did I do it? Hmm. And so he doesn't say chocolate cake, but he does talk about overindulgence or choices that people regret. How did that happen? How could I know that something was wrong in one sense and yet go ahead and do it? And then I'm kicking myself afterwards. Everybody, no matter what generation or culture you live in, has that type of experience. He addresses it. And he addresses hundreds of those types of examples that, uh, that matter to people, choices they make every day that pertain to how well their lives go or how poorly their lives go, and whether it's possible to change, make those changes going forward. He addresses those sorts of issues, and, his, and he takes up all different fields in which they can apply, whether it's in medical science and health, whether it's with education, whether you know, what kinds of friends you should have or keep certain friends, why is friendship valuable? There's so many different topics that he, he wrestles with in this work and that matter to people today uh, that it's, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who wouldn't find worthwhile insights on topics of that matter deeply to them. Yeah, well said, for sure. Mm -hmm. If I could add one other thing, just on, we mentioned the Joe Sachs translation, but he's not, e Aristotle's not easy to read. It's, it's an old language translated by some good and some not as good translators. And one of the benefits we are getting from this uh, discussion, this Aristotle discussion group we have is that similarly, we wrestle with what he's saying. So, just, just a word of warning that reading Aristotle on your own can be difficult, but it's well worth it. Yeah, and just to reiterate, like the premise of the show is not that you, although you might, you might be interested and motivated to go out and read the Nicomachean Ethics or other works by Aristotle, but I'm proceeding on the, uh, the standing order that you're not going to do that, which means it's my job, mm -hmm. it's my responsibility to dig out the best material and yeah. to present it to you in really clear, usable form. And that also means that on this show, we're going to go through the Nicomachean Ethics, but we're not going to dive into like every question of scholarship and, and what does Aristotle mean here or there, uh, perhaps some of those. But primarily what we want to do is focus on, you know, with the, the basis of this show, philosophy for flourishing. What does Aristotle give us that is helpful toward that end? So I know I'm already getting a ton out of the Nicomachean Ethics, and I hope to bring that to you guys soon. Uh, if you're if you're finding these ideas really helpful and building your own operating system for flourishing, mm -hmm. uh, I hope you'll hit subscribe and leave us a review. It's small, but it really does go a long way. And if you have any comments or questions, you can email me at john at theobjectivestandard.com. All the best in your quest for flourishing. Thanks again, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Be well. <laughs>